Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, I think we can go ahead and get started. We have um, quite a few people on the line, 42 right now. So Brian, do you wanna go ahead and get us kicked off? Thank you, Holly. Let's begin by welcoming you there. We've got over 40 of you today. Thank you so much um, on behalf of our board of directors and our general manager. Uh, we, 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 we've got less runway ahead of us than we do behind us now on Reimagine RTD. We are getting ready to land um, this first quarter into the second quarter of this year. Thank you for sticking with us. In terms of a safety moment, we just wanted to recognize that we know in a group of this size and with our geographic coverage that some of you may have been directly or indirectly uh, impacted by the, the, the horrific fire that occurred. And so in terms of a safety moment, first of all, we wanna recognize that we're, we're thinking and, and we wanna be able to help uh, obviously in any way that we can. But more than that, it just underlines how the unexpected perhaps could be occurring more frequently than we ever thought before. So be ready to the extent that you can. You all know how to do that. We hope that you would never have to do that. Some of you may have had to do that. Um, so stay safe, be ready for the unexpected and uh, hope that you're all, all safe out there and that you, you know, those of you who have been directly affected that you have a good path forward. And thank you for joining us today. And in spite of what, what has occurred, we, we really truly appreciate it. We can't do this project without you. So with that, uh, you see the agenda before you we're going to cover some uh, update type materials and introducing some new things to you that, that uh, will provide some additional insight, wrap up with where we're headed. And with that, I will turn it back over to Holly and her team. Thank you again. Super. Thanks, Brian. Um, so yeah, a bit more about the agenda here. We're going to We've we had an opportunity to speak with many of you on the um, draft system optimization plan when we have the service sector meetings towards the beginning of December. Um, so we're going to give you an update on what we've heard so far, some comments to date. It's actually not um, fully up to date, but some of the comments we heard during that um, the service sector meetings. We'll show you, we have um, provided and developed a new commenting tool that we're going to step you through, show you how to use it, and then We'll also send you some information for um, developing press releases and um, some outward facing materials that you can use to help us solicit more input using that commenting tool. Um, and then we'll talk about next steps, the third and final service sector meeting that will be combined with the rebuilding services subgroup meeting. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that and, and try and set a date for that. Um, and then the next part, we'll talk about the mobility plan for the future. Um, you know, we've been um, eking away at all of the pieces and parts that go into this. Um, today, we're going to hear a bit about um, some of the revenue, the Tabor revenue analysis that's been completed. I think that will be very interesting um, and informative for um, what's happened in the past, but to inform the future, of course. Um, and then last time we met, we covered um, a number of angles from the mobility plan for the future, but we were not able to cover the preliminary parking recommendations that are coming out of that analysis. So we have an opportunity to do that today. And then of course, we've been talking um, incrementally over the last several meetings about what the zero emission vehicle analysis and the facility analysis um, is looking like and how that's coming together. So we have a bit of information on that and then wanna follow up on a possible working group there. And then of course, we'll hit on some um, public engagement and next steps as well. So our first item we're gonna jump into is some information on the system optimization plan. We're gonna have a very brief recap of you know, the steps that we went through. I think most of you have seen this so we can go through that quickly. Um, Doug Monroe, if you're out there, I'm, I'm assuming you're gonna cover this. And then the SOP recommendations, the travel markets, and then the first few slides here just to talk about um, that what this included for anybody who was not able to participate in the service sector meetings. Okay. So, uh, so one of the major components of Reimagine RTD was the system optimization plan. And why are we doing a system optimization plan? Well, RTD hasn't taken a, I guess, uh, a look at the whole system uh, 
for planning purposes since uh, really since they switched to the grid system in 1978. And uh, as we've opened rail lines and uh, and built out the fast track system, we have modified the bus system to complement those uh, those investments. But we really haven't uh, taken uh, th those kind of those those uh, plans kind of focused on corridors, and we really haven't taken a look at the entire system. So. Uh, the, the goals with the system optimization plan were to, to reverse and mitigate the trends of uh, ridership loss that we, that RTD and many uh, transit agencies across the country have had been seeing uh, for the last, uh, I don't know, half, uh, half decade or, or so. Um, improve RTD's financial situation uh, for fiscal stability, uh, focus on uh, improving service performance on our bus routes and um, and remaining competitive in the travel uh, in the travel market. So uh, about a year ago or so we we've wrapped up the comprehensive assessment of services that looked at the existing services that we already operated uh, and then, Really, for the last uh, two two and a half years or so since Reimagine has kicked off, we've been looking at what uh, what the uh, what the system the ideal system would look like, and that's what's uh, turned into the draft system optimization plan that uh, that is Great. the draft is being released Great. now. So if we go to the next slide, uh, the things that this SOP the system optimization plan is focusing on are um, are modifying our family of services. Previously, we had family of services consisted of uh, services like the CBD local routes that went to downtown, urban local routes that uh, that were in you know the, the urban area, um, and urban local routes um, to name a few. In addition to the regional and express routes, uh, that were more based on uh, the land use surrounding those routes rather than the type of service that they actually offered. Uh, so SOP is uh, looking to to. Uh, kind of revamp the way that those family of services are looked at. Um, support well-defined transit transfer hubs for connectivity. Um, and that, that goes into um, another uh, route, route design principle that I'll get to in a minute here. Uh, retaining clock-faced headways. What we mean by that is, uh, is schedules that uh, basically repeat every hour. Uh, and what that does is uh, allows schedules to be uh, allows the schedules to be uh, better remembered by passengers. Uh, the schedules are simpler to, to understand, uh, knowing that you know the bus comes outside my door on the hour and half hour or on the hour, 15 minutes, half hour and 45 past or something like that. And they also really allow uh, for good connections between routes uh, if all routes, uh, if, if all routes are operating on those clock fake headways uh, where they, will cross each other, uh, you know, on a consistent every 15 or 30 minutes or so. And then co defining consistent minimum spans of service uh, for the for the family of services that uh, that we are proposing. Uh, for bus route design, we're looking at simplification, uh, looking at uh, uh, keeping routes, uh, you know, on the most logical path through the uh, through the city and through the metro area to make those easy to understand. Uh, consistency, getting rid of uh, short turns and you know buses that don't make the uh, the whole trip, which it ends up being confusing for customers if they get on the wrong bus. Uh, and having those consistent service spans, and then as I mentioned, uh, having well-defined transfer hubs for connectivity. Looking at reliability, we're looking at elimination of long routes. And when we say that, we don't mean that we're looking to eliminate service on those routes necessarily, but looking at breaking up those routes into smaller, more manageable routes uh, that provide better reliability for passengers uh, and having those connections at the, uh, at the transfer hubs. Um, so those, uh, so those, those corridors would, would continue to have service um, and generally looking at those transfer hubs as, as areas where there's usually not a whole lot of through ridership. There's always already a lot of transfers at those, at those locations anyway. Uh, so uh, splitting up routes at those, uh, those well-defined trans transfer hubs. Go to the next slide. So uh, looking at the four proposed family of services, uh, the, the four uh, service categories for the system optimization plan, uh, core routes are those routes that uh, have the highest frequency, are regionally focused, 
uh, and the, the core routes are, uh, you know, have a definite minimum uh, service span of 18 hours and have 15 minute all day service uh, on weekdays. The next category is connect routes, and those are similar to the, to the core routes in that they're regionally focused, um, but generally operating in areas that, uh, that, you know, don't have quite the density, don't have quite the ridership as the core routes. So uh, still, you know, focus on having those, uh, those regional trips, but not quite as long of a span of service and, um, and varying headways to actually match the demand of the, uh, of the, of the route. Commute routes are kind of specialized routes within the, uh, within the system optimization plan. And those are uh, generally focused on specific uh, high, high utilization employment areas. Uh, for example, like, uh, like downtown Denver and uh, uh, DEN airport. Uh, so providing those services that generally operate uh, around that are generally uh, focused around shift times or uh, the workday are, are what the commute routes are designed to provide. And then community routes are kind of, uh, are kind of routes that, uh, that provide a more localized, uh, tailored service to what is actually needed in those areas. So those uh, end up being uh, routes uh, that you know don't really have a regional focus um, and don't uh, always have uh, a high ridership, but uh, in this in this case, you know many of them because of their unique nature, uh, many of our services do fall in the community use, uh, community routes. Examples being like the 16th Street Mall ride because that is such a relatively short route. Uh, it's only about a mile and a half long and is entirely within Denver, but uh, because of its unique nature and, and needs for that service, uh, it falls into the community category. So let's, can we just pause here? Katie, can you go back up one for us for a minute? Let's just pause here for a second, Doug. And at one of the comments that we had in the service sector meetings was, there was some um, thought that maybe there was a hierarchy here that you were graduating from one type of service to another. And that's not really how the services are set up. They're more set to serve a particular travel market. So can you talk a little bit about that, Doug? Because I feel like there was a bit of confusion around that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, these are, yeah, I mean, they're designed to, to serve a certain travel market. Uh, they, it's not, uh, you know, it's not that your route that's a community route would, you know, gain such high ridership that uh, it, uh, you know, it, it graduates to the connect category or something like that. It's, um, it, it's, it's mainly focused on the travel market that those serve. And because, you know, community routes serve a smaller uh, subset of the district, um, you know, really focused within a single municipality usually, um, that, that allows them to, uh, to, to kind of dictate the, the level of service and the span of service that they provide. Um, you know, it's, it's probably not in the best interest of many of the routes that they would want to graduate to a higher level of service because, you know, then they're going to be compared against, uh, you know, many, much, many, you know, very high performing routes. Um, you know, looking at it the same way from the connect category, uh, it's, um, it's, you know, kind of focused on the, the span and the, uh, the span and the uh, frequency of the service there. And, uh, you know, they, they certainly could uh, have frequency and, and span be bumped up to, to the point that it looks very much like a core route. Um, but, you know, due to the travel market that it's actually serving, uh, it, it would probably, it would stay as a connect route and it, it probably wouldn't be uh, in, you know, those passengers or, or that municipality's best interest that that, uh, that, that route actually change its uh, service category. Perfect, thank you. Okay. So uh, this slide just has uh, some of the, the statistics uh, coming out of this system optimization plan. I believe we have the map on this one uh, that well, uh, should phase in here, right? 
I, th I think so. Yeah, there, there we, we go. go. Okay. Um, so this, uh, so uh, as Katie advances this here, uh, the red lines here are the rail network. The yellow lines are the community network. Uh, and then as she adds on top, the green lines are the commute network. Uh, adding onto that, the orange lines are the connect, and then the blue lines are the core network. Um, so it gives you kind of idea, an idea of how those, uh, those different service categories uh, fit in with each other and where those routes kind of are placed throughout the system. Uh, over on the left side of the slide, we have uh, some, some stats about the service hours that are provided by each, uh, each category of service. Uh, with Core and Connect um, providing about the same number of service hours, uh, and then you know quite quite a bit fewer with the specialized commute and community routes, uh, but still providing uh, a lot of service through there. Um, a couple of interesting notes uh, towards on the bottom left there: uh, a flatter service profile means that uh, with the system optimization plan, there'll actually be more service offered throughout the day rather than focusing on you know, the AM and PM peaks, which was uh, really when RTD generated most of its uh, ridership, but also had to provide a lot. Of is that you, Doug, or is somebody not muted? That, that was not me. I think we might need to mute. I'm not sure who it is. Okay. Um, so uh, not focusing on the peaks has the, uh, has the uh, uh, provides more all day service for, for passengers, makes things more consistent there. And also has, uh, has a workforce benefit for RTD. Uh, as many, many of you I'm sure are aware with RTD's workforce challenges and providing operators for routes. Um, and it's really one of our major limitations to restoring and expanding service right now. Um, but having, uh, having less of a peaked service in the AM and PM peak uh, gets rid of split shifts for operators, which makes, uh, which makes the overall uh, runs for the operators more desirable. Uh, so that uh, should help with our workforce uh, retention as well. One thing I also wanted to mention here, uh, specifically about the uh, social, the comment about the social equity groups, this was one of the really big takeaways from the location-based services data analysis that we did at the beginning of the project. Um, when we tied travel patterns from that location-based services analysis to the social equity populations and where they lived around the, um, around the metro area, that's where we discovered that there was a flatter travel pattern throughout the day for that group of people. So um, we're happy to see this you know, response to that and being able to do that. And of course, as Doug mentioned, um, a lot of the feedback that we got on issues with workforce um, split shifts being of course, one of those in this helping with that. So those were two great, um, two great um, responses that the SOP was able to help with. Um, even with a limited budget and um, you know not having all the money to work with, so so that was great. So getting into some of the uh, stakeholder feedback that we we've received so far, uh, so we first shared this with the RTD board in late November and early December, and then uh, in mid December we met with the five uh, service sector groups uh, that have been established, uh, and that's the Northeast, Northwest, Southeast, Southwest, and then uh, the Boulder County uh, service sector. And we went route by route through uh, for the routes that serve each of those service sectors. Um, and you can see a little bit of uh, the, the main, uh, the main uh, feedback that we got from those service sectors on this slide here. Um, I don't know if uh, if we're planning to address any of them today, but uh, I, no, those are going in the hopper and will be addressed as we um, address the whole set of comments. But yeah. these were some of the initial ones that we received in the service sector meeting. Okay. And so I think that's what we have for the service sectors and then getting into how the, the general public and everybody else can comment on it. I think Holly's gonna take that. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm going to I'm going to attempt to. Katie, I need to um, I need to be able to share my screen. I was going to um, I was going to step us through an example here. Okay. 
hopefully. Hey, uh, Holly, can I ask you a quick question? Please. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you could uh, maybe Doug could, uh, could please provide more definitions on the uh, or the purpose of the connection or the connector or connect bus route. What does that exactly mean or rail? Uh, I, I know you're, there's a difference on the in terms of the service span, but in terms of the purpose, how how exactly you define that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can do that. And I don't know if we have, um, if you want to do that now, Doug, or I, and I'm not sure if we have Jim on the line today, actually. Um, but, but we can follow up on see that. Jim. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, okay. so Amethyst. Between core and connect, they're all defined as regionally focused. And uh, so it's just a yep. frequency are different, right? And also, yeah. you have this regionally focused local bus. Why do we have local uh, there right? if it's regionally focused? I, I, that's another question I was wondering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that may, we may be having a, a nomenclature issue there. Yeah, and I can, I can touch on a couple of those things while we get to the map here. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think you've got it, though, Hulang, with... Uh, with the connect, uh, you know, the, the main difference is the frequency and the span. Um, and it's really, uh, you know, a matter of looking at the, um, the, the travel markets along those routes and, uh, you know, what basically what frequency and which span should be uh, provided as part of them. So that's, um, you know, that's the idea between the difference uh, between connect and core. Um, as far as uh, local, regionally focused local routes, I think local routes um, being being the key word there. Uh, local routes being routes that make all the stops along a route, and really what what that's meaning is that uh, you know those those local routes, Colfax, for example, uh, Alameda, um, you know they go across jurisdictional boundaries. They're 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 regional and that they can take somebody across the region. Um, and the, the, the service itself is called a local service because of, uh, of basically its stopping pattern, I would say. Yeah, it's, the, it's almost the frequency of the stops. Right. But I think to your point, Hu Lang, I feel like, um, like it feels a little, as I'm, as I'm hearing Doug say it, I'm realizing that it does feel a little like, um, what, what's the term inside baseball or, or what? I should, I should never use sports analogies, but that it's something like that, you know, where we use that language and that may not resonate like outwardly facing. So as we continue to message this more to the public, let's look at that and see if we can um, make So that. you're basically providing the connection and the accessibility uh, on a regional scale or level, uh, but uh, with, with very good local access. Yeah. And so okay, the, let's, um, I want to show you all the, um, the tool and I was going to step you through from the beginning just to make sure that you could all see how this works. And, and you may have already had a chance to do this, but um, so when you search up reimagine RTD, you get, hopefully it's your first link that comes up and it'll take you into this location here. And this is actually hosted right here. We're still on the RTD website. Then you go to share your ideas and that's how you actually get to the tool. So there, there's a couple steps. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, you all can be the, um, our, our um, ambassadors for helping people navigate to this. Um, there are, as we put information out, there's a couple links um, that get you directly to this, but nonetheless, it is, um, you know, a couple steps to get in here. So um, once you're into this site, you can see the RTD is asking for your input. You can download this um, document, um, which we can look at in a minute. But what I want to actually have you look at is the tool that we've put together to um, specifically seek input. Um, so this is um, an Esri-based, GIS-based tool that we've developed here, and it has um, this gives you a bit of information about the tool, what the SOP is, and then it provides you information about how to leave a comment. You just hit enter. Um, 
from this site, you can um, you can see we already have a couple of public comments. These are the yellow dots that are in here. And if you're interested in seeing what somebody had to say, you can click on that yellow dot and see that they talked about um, similar to LD1, could Dash be kept on South Boulder instead of jogging into downtown Louisville? So there's some, and we already have received a few comments. So I'm very excited about that. And they're, they're very helpful comments. Um, you can turn those public, you know, as more public comments come in, hopefully you'll see a lot of yellow dots. So it might be a little overwhelming. You might want to turn that off. You can also turn the all routes off and then start to look in more detail at the specific core routes. So these are the core bus routes. And then you can look at the core rail routes. So you can see those pop on. Um, then you can add to it and start to see the different lines grow up over time or take them off as you're trying to um, dig into a particular route. You can also search for a route. Um, you can also search for a route by its route number here. So if you were interested in say looking at the um, route zero, you would type zero. It will zoom you into that location. It will give you a pop-up and it will tell you, okay, you're at the route zero. What type of route is this? It's core. And then it will let you click on this attachment and say, I wanna see what those recommendations are for the route zero. So you click on that, it pops open um, a new, this is the, the cut sheets that you all saw in the service sector meetings. So it gives you more information about what the changes to the route zero are um, and what the proposed service plan is. Um, if you want to, so there's, there's several ways to dig into, um, to dig into the tool here. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to show you was the commenting tool. Um, let's see here. Oops, just a minute. Oh, here's another interesting thing. When you click on this core bus routes um, or any of these, you can get a definition of each of these, which is helpful if you're looking for a little more detail about what each of those stands for. Again, this is, we may actually need to look at the wording on that. Um, given Hugh Lang's comment that we received, but there, there's some good information within there uh, for the moment. Um, and then I'm going to turn on public comments. Um, so we click on this public comment over here and you click on RTD public comments and then you're going to click on wherever it is that you would like to um, provide a comment. Say you're looking at um, the 15 and I want to say um, this is a test. The 15 is a great route. So then that'll add a new comment to, to the site and the, and the public will be able to see it and you'll be able to see it pop up there. Um, let's see if there's any other, there's, there are ways to dig it. Let me see if I can go over to here. Um, Let's see here. So this tool, when we go over, I mean, you can just, there's a lot of ways you can slice and dice this, but you, this tool, as you move into the second one here, allows you to zoom in on the Northwest and Boulder area, if you're particularly interested in looking at what's happening up in this location. Um, and you can do that for the other service sectors as well. Um, but that's not that's not needed for you to go. Just you can just poke around the site and move around and um, pick pick routes at your leisure, whatever you um, are interested in looking at, and then providing comments. Um, so that is what I wanted to share. If I don't know if we have any comments or questions for Doug or thoughts on the tool. Um, oh, thank you, Julie did put a link to the tool over in the chat. I see. Um, any, any feedback or thoughts for us at this point? Holly, I think you're muted. You got muted, Holly. I don't know what happened. Thank you. Um, I see some comments and I think Sarah, you're first up. Thanks, Holly. Um, Sarah, City and County of Brimfield. Um, just a comment on the landing page. Um, for the RTD website, mm -hmm. uh, where you say RTD is seeking your input, big bold letters, but then under here it says click here. I don't know, I kind of missed it. 
Um, and it seems yeah. like the map is a really important piece. So maybe there could be an yeah. icon of a map and then maybe a short description under it, um, similar to the pop-up when you open up Esri. So people really know what they're looking at um, before they click on the map. Um, yeah, so they just don't skip over that pop-up as some people do. Yes. So an icon of the map or something that makes the, the click here stand out more. And then what was the second one, Sarah? I wasn't following uh, that. Yeah, so when you open up the Esri, there's a pop-up window that oh, says, yeah, you know, this, this is the, the 2027. Um, yep. So maybe you know a condensed version of that underneath that map link and say, click on this map you know, to provide those comments. Okay. I don't know, I okay. totally missed it the first time around when I was looking at this um, splash page. Yep, yep. Yeah, this, I, I also tend to, we try to make the words really big, how to comment, because I also am like, click, just move me into the next, but you actually missed some kind of important information there. So yeah, we'll see if we can make that, um, that stand out a bit better. Um, I see a hand up from Kent. I, I had a similar comment to Sarah's. I was wondering if we can simplify the number of clips, clicks that they have to go. If they went to the RTD main page, as opposed to have to go to reimagine and, and they click and then they get into the, the page that they need to get to, it, it might be good to also have it there besides just under reimagine. In other words, if you right. want maximum public input, put it on their main page. Um, um, with a little icon saying um, for, for review or something. That's just yeah. my recommendation. Uh, yeah. But, but the, fewer the, the fewer clicks, the better. Uh, otherwise yeah. people get frustrated and not comment. Yes, I totally agree. Now, Julie, I think you provided direct links to the map in your, or how did you do that in the um, no, okay. we, we kind of all said it the same way. So it goes to reimagine, okay. but, you know, but we can send out a link specifically to the social pinpoint. Okay. It, that, that, that'd be my recommendation if we're putting this out for community input, if we could have a direct link into this map, I think it would help. Yeah, I'll see to... what I can do. You know, one, one is controlled by RTD and then one is on the consultant side, which is why there's clicks. But I agree that if we want to optimize, we'll do our best to get it you know, closer to that homepage and see what yeah, we can do. I, I doubt you get it down to one click, but it'd be nice to, to reduce <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. the confusion. Get so. closer. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Kent. Danny? Yeah, good, good afternoon. Danny O'Connor, City of Boulder. So just to appreciate the discussion and how, how all this is being packaged and, um, you know, getting ready for present. I guess one question on the map, and, and I haven't, Pardon me, I haven't had a chance to play around with it or, or look into it, but is there an option to see what the network was previously and or to click on deleted or routes that are proposed for discontinuation? For discontinuation, or to see, okay, yeah. Yeah, we or did. to see pre previous alignments or, you know, just um, yeah. so that... Uh, Let me see here. We did, um, so we actually tried to make... Um, and, you know, here you're using the tool. Esri is the tool we have available, right? So it's not like we build it from the back. So we tried to get Esri to when we put a route in that had been that has been, say, discontinued to have it pop up information for that. And I know we we were not successful in that. But let me see if there was some discussion about having the previous network on there. Let me. Oh, let's see. There is a the 20. 19 routes route network let me just let me just see what i have here i'm not sharing with you anymore unfortunately but i am I'm over here clicking away to see what i can find for you um so the the map does include the 2019 route network okay now what you're not gonna you're not gonna see tons of information on it um you know so you can click on a route and find out that it's say it's the 122x say just as an example, um, but it's not going to give you, you know, you have to be in the SOP recommendations to see what was and what, um, and what is proposed. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and I see Sarah that you put in here, it's 2019 core routes, which I think is actually an incorrect label that I will get. Correct. SOP core. 
It appears all the routes are included, um, but it's I don't see routes. it up here on your screen, Holly, but I see it online when I opened up Esri. Yes, it is. It's all routes. It says it's core routes and it's not. It's all routes. Okay. Yeah. And I guess I was just trying to think, you know, there are some cases or where routes are consolid, you know, consolidated and just how to make yep. sure it's directed your, or, you know, the person who's trying to find whichever route they're most interested in and okay, yep. you know, here it is. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's, it's a lot of information on a map, right? But it yeah. is pretty, if you turn on all routes and then you turn on 2019 routes, you can see where like a little tail has been trimmed up or, you know, information or a, or a route has been, is not there anymore. Okay. So hopefully that will help. No, that's, that's great. And then I guess kind of a, on a related item, just for information and, and Doug, this is probably a question to you because like I remember during our service sector meetings, we talked about, you know, just the importance of transit centers and different hubs and, and being a, a big kind of component of, of where routes are going to stage and coming out of, is there a way, is there a way to even break it down to what, what's, what's being hubbed at certain locations or planned for that? or where, where that information is available, so. Um, I don't, I think that might be something we could ask Jim to put together, Holly. I don't think we mm -hmm. put together a list of routes by location or anything like that. And I'm so, like yeah. thinking like the transit centers or, you know, at, at this location, here's, you know, just a quick way to know everything that's proposed to operate there, so. So, so let me make sure that I understand the question. So having the hubs, like the park and rides, just use those as an example. They're not necessarily all park and rides, but park and rides on here with SOP routes that are connecting there. Is yeah, this? yeah, that could, that could be it. And or, you know, even, you know, which like a way to click on Union Station and say, okay, it's these routes are um, still serving there and or, you know, or maybe there's some new ones based upon how this is designed. And so uh -huh. it's kind of a one, one quick, um, really for the, you know, as people orient themselves around transit centers and the transfer opportunities, just how to, mm -hmm. how to either get to that in the SOP documents and or this map. So, mm -hmm. It's a little yeah. like if you were using a Google Maps and you click on one of RTD's stop locations, it tells you that these two routes stop at this location, if, if yeah. I'm following what you're asking for. Yeah, yeah, and just, you know, having it, if possible, pin, pin to those, those major transfer, if it's a park and ride or a transit center. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, I think actually... Well, I don't want to make promises I can't keep, but I think this is something that we could we can add to it. Yeah. Um, so I will I will absolutely look at that. I think it's a great idea. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Super. Um, let's see. I see a um, I see a hand up, Mac. I see your hand up. Yes. Thank you, Kali. Yeah. It, you know, looks like a great tool. Um, uh, I do have a few questions in terms of the time frame that we're looking at for this. Uh, my understanding is that the system optimization plan is really a, a, a six-year plan uh, going out in the future. And uh, what's catching my eye, particularly in the Aerotropolis area, and the I-70 corridor, E-470, where we have explosive growth in and, uh, and continued fast pace uh, development, both on the employment side and, and the residential side. Um, how is that area going to be uh, addressed relative mm -hmm. to service? Mm -hmm. um, Doug, I don't know if you wanna take a crack at that, but I would, um, RTD still plans to um, evaluate the services provided on the, um, three times a year, Doug, do I have that right? Three times a year basis. Um, that's where they're looking at land use patterns, land uses, new developments that have come in, the service that they have on the ground, trying to remain fiscally um, responsible as well. 
um, and modifying services to meet or adding services or, or you know, removing services that aren't working perhaps um, three times a year. So there, there is an opportunity that's continuously, because there is development, tons of development always occurring in our area where RTD is um, pretty consistently evaluating what's happening and making adjustments to the system. Doug, you probably have a better answer than that. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's probably the best way to look at it. Uh, I mean, I know that uh, Aurora has made that comment and as we about, as we go through the comments um, for the SOP here, uh, I know we're gonna take a look at that area, um, but you know, as, as we move forward and as development occurs out there, uh, we'll certainly be looking at, you know, how, how we can serve it uh, and, uh, you know, what, what types of services can be provided in that area. Yeah, okay. Uh, th thank you, Holly and, and Doug for that. And, and again, we would, um, uh, uh, we're anxious to, uh, to engage in that uh, continual uh, conversation and in delivering value and, and services to all our customers um, yeah. as, as they are rapidly materializing and being created. Good. Thank you. Good, that's the goal. Let's get some more people on RTD. Indeed. Um, okay, Hugh Lang? Yeah, thank you, Holly. Quick question. Um, can we assume that the, uh, only the core uh, services will have a 15 minute frequency in all the uh, non-core service such as connectors, the connect service, it will be 30 or longer, the uh, lower service frequency. Is that the, a valid assumption? No, that's no, it could definitely. And Doug, I'm going to turn this over to you. But I think Doug made a really good example earlier when we talk about, for instance, you know, it is it's not a hierarchy from low to high, it is, you know, tailored to meet the travel market. So, you know, on the one end, we have community services, you might think of the 16th Street Mall, more frequent service than any other service that RTD has out there, higher ridership but it's in the community route because of the market that it's serving. Um, so it, even though it has better than 15 minute frequency, it does not, it's not considered a core service. So you could uh, have services and service patterns um, uh, that vary in the different categories. Um, so, so do you mean there are 15 minute frequency for the connect category? Um, I'm not, I'm, I actually am not sure if there is one in there that does particularly have that, Doug. Uh, there, there are routes, I can't pick an example, but there are routes in the Connect category that have 15 minute peak service uh, okay. and generally have lower service in off peak times. Uh, and then like, as, as Holly mentioned, the, you know, the 16th Street Mall ride is, is a uh, community route. Um, you know, another good example of that is route skip up in Boulder. Uh, along the Broadway corridor because it doesn't leave Boulder. It's a community route, but it actually is proposed to run at 10 minutes or better service uh, all day on weekdays. Okay, thank you. So the core service uh, will have 15 or better frequency. Is that right? Yeah, the, so I, yeah, I think that the core category is the only one where every route has 15 minute or better service all day on weekdays, but any of the other categories can have high frequency service uh, at any or all parts of the day. Okay, and to the, uh, are the, uh, the core uh, is seven days a week? No, it's weekday. Uh, weekday, okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, David? Um, I, I appreciate the, the comments of, of many of the folks here, um, and I appreciate uh, Doug's response that uh, the three times a year um, service adjustments are the, are the right way to watch performance uh, across the whole system. I think we want to make sure the whole system is performing um, for, for all parties across the entire region. So I think that's, those, those are important things to watch out for. And you know, I think RTD has got a number of variables they're going to have to juggle between now and 2027, um, not just looking at the ridership performance, but uh, at budgets mm -hmm. and uh, operator availability and things like that. So uh, I appreciate the complexity here and, and look forward to tracking this uh, with the rest of the region uh, 
through performance metrics over time. Fantastic. Thanks, David. Um, okay. I, oh, let's see. I think I, Sarah, did you just pop a hand up? Uh, yeah, one, one quick final question, comment. Um, thank you, Julie, for clarifying um, the coming period ends on February 9th. Um, and I understand the board has a tight timeline, um, but it just seems like a very short amount of time to try to get the information out to the public, to comment on a plan that is really setting the tone for the next five years for transit in our region. And I'm just wondering what RTD might be doing to be sure we're getting engagement um, from not only our current transit riders, but transit riders that maybe are not using the system right now and um, future transit riders to try to get their input on this. I'd be happy to jump in on that one, Holly. So, so we're working with RTD, Sarah, we appreciate it. In fact, you were one of the first to reach out to help us get the word out. We really appreciate it. Um, we are gonna get an email out after this meeting to provide you guys. So we're hopefully you can kind of help us get the word out. Um, there is a press release going out, hopefully today, if not tomorrow. Um, so we're gonna do a press release. We've got a whole social media campaign around this through RTD. We're sending out e-blast and we're also doing um, a news stop article. So we're doing lots of different outreach individually through, um, through RTD. And again, now we've reached out also to our partner organizations. Um, we've got a, a, a kit for anybody who's interested. Like I said, we'll send it out here after the meeting um, to, for you guys to help get the word out. And, and if anybody's interested in individual meetings specifically to the SOP, please let me know. And I'm happy to organize um, more individual small group meetings, like we're meeting with the INC. Thank you, Joel, tomorrow. Um, so any other opportunities, we'd be happy to, to facilitate those as well. So Julie, uh, this is Christine. I wanted to add a little bit more to that. Please. This is Christina from Community Engagement at RTD. I wanted to also mention that in addition to the comment period that we just mentioned that runs through February 9th on this particular commenting tool, all the recommendations that we have coming out of the SOP will be looked at again in as part of the implementation process. So it won't all come in one swoop, meaning that we will start some of the early recommendations later this year. And of course, over five years as mentioned, but the important part there is it's gonna be rolled into our usual service change process, which happens three times a year. And that will have a comment period as we usually do. We have public meetings that are part of that. So uh, we will take each part of these recommendations individually out and have public meetings as we move forward over the next five years. Uh, thank you, Julie. Thank you, Christina. Um, much appreciated uh, for all that information. Um, I'm really glad I reached out in December to get that link out so we could get it out in our January newsletter. Um, and our community um, works on it bit ahead of its schedule. So in the future, it'd be helpful, you know, to get any kind of toolkits out, information links, um, well in advance of actually starting the commenting process, especially on something that is this important and monumental and setting the tone for the future. Um, I do understand with, that we'll have opportunities, you know, with future REN boards, but this appears to be setting up the framework for where we want to be by 2027. So it seems pretty important and I just wanna be sure that um, folks are given adequate time to understand what's going on and um, be able to get their input. Thank you. Director Williams. Let me find the unmute button. You'd think I would have it glued to my hand by now. Um, <laughs> I see D Director Cook has some really good comments that are directly related to my input, which is I'd really like to make sure that we get this out to people who are not writers, who, who would be writers. Um, you know, maybe we need to take out a half page in the Denver Post. Do they still publish it in paper these days? Um, and to Denver Streets Partners and to uh, Dr. Cog's various groups, so that people who are not necessarily riding today understand that they can have input into the rides that they will be taking in the next few years when they have to get out of their cars in order to save the air for their grandchildren. Thanks. So there is a question about how other, um, you know, there's a group of people obviously that have been with us through the reimagined process um, from the beginning and how other municipalities engage. 
Um, and Christina, do you want to weigh in or Julie, there is, um, you sort of touched on this already, but there are, um, we did some separate for our technical working group that has been providing us input throughout the process. We did those separate service sector meetings, but there are more service sector meetings coming up um, and listening sessions, as well as this public tool that are open to the broader group. Julie or Christina, do you want to weigh in? Well, I can start and then Christina can jump in. In addition to, you're right, we have been very focused on the DWG and the AC and then just kind of the general public. A couple other things we are doing. Um, we are working with RTD's research group to look at doing a series of customer focus groups. So these are just going to be really focused on those individuals that actually ride the system. We're looking at doing that in early February. But then to Christina's point, you know, we're also incorporating this into your ongoing, RTD's ongoing service planning process. And so in uh, the late last year, we, they were more TWG focused. We did a whole series of, of service sector meetings a lot of you guys attended. And then Christina has been leading um, over the, this week and next uh, another set of um, just listening sessions with a much broader group with all the municipalities, you know, as part of our normal service standard process. And then there will be public hearings in addition um, that will be advertised uh, very broadly with press releases and things like that. Um, so we are, so in addition to the TWG, we're also leveraging the service, uh, service planning process to make sure that we're getting out to as broad a group of municipalities as possible. Um, Christina, did you have anything to add to that? Really, thank you. I think you covered a good majority of it. I, I would say that part of the, the listening session process, and I, I know many of you on this, this meeting right now do participate in those, um, but as part of that, we're also encouraging folks that maybe want to drill down a little bit more to, to have these conversations now uh, by contacting Julie. So <laughs> Julie, I'm, I'm drumming up some more business for you, but um, we've been sharing, uh, of course, contact information to, again, have these sidebar conversations as, as they drill down a little bit more on specifics as needed. And that's a great point. I will actually put my um, email. And so if any of you get approached by somebody or an organization or a group that's interested in having a one-on-one -on -one meeting or they're interested in a particular geographic area, have, feel free to have them reach out to me and I'll arrange something directly with them. Mm -hmm. um, Julie, there's also a comment about other direct comments. So the, the in addition to this tool, if you want to comment on the map, you can, but there's also a tool for providing um, on the same website for general comments. Um, are there other opportunities for general commenting outside of those two? I think those are the main, um, you know, the, the main, I think there is an opportunity uh, through the website, like you said, we've got the commenting tools and then there's also an opportunity to put um, through emails and also people can, they can also call RTD directly and they will get routed to us as well. Okay. Okay, good. Lots of um, lots of ways to get input. Julie, do you want to cover this next one, and then we'll move into the mobility plan for the future. You bet. Now, I apologize. I've got a little construction noise going on in my neighbor's house. Um, so just very quickly, we talked about most of this. So we talked about we are in the process as part of the service planning process. Um, that Christina has been leading a series of listening sessions that we started this week and we'll finish up over the next week. And again, these are broad, any kind of comment. You're talking about generic comments, like anything that can be coming up to these meetings, whether it's a question on the SOP, whether it's a question on the service process, whether it's a question on upcoming um, you know, changes to run boards. So those are going on. We're obviously having our meetings um, with the technical working group. And then tomorrow we do our advisory committee. They'll be seeing very similar information. Um, and then in that mid January timeframe, we're providing a, a briefing to the board, it's just a, a briefing packet. So we're keeping the board informed. We'll be providing a little bit more information about the feedback that we're getting. Um, and then as we talked about, we originally had the SOP public tool closing on the, on the first, but based on some of the feedback, we have extended that a week. Uh, so we do have that the public comment period up until the 9th. For those of you um, who were in the sessions in December, you know, we have a little bit uh, earlier appointment, we were hoping to get comments from you by January 21st. And again, that is because we want to make sure that we're sharing the comments that we get from you with the board. So again, it's it's all about making sure that we're gathering this information and getting it in front of the board of directors before there is a decision to be made in, in the March timeframe. So based on all this feedback, we'll be looking at incorporating comments, finalizing the, the draft SOP in February. 
Um, we will also be holding in about the mid-February timeframe one more one more group of our, our rebuilding services uh, working group. And, and again, that's that's been, we've met individually and then we broke it out into the service sectors. We're gonna do one more group meeting with everyone together just to talk about the changes and talk about the feedback that we've gotten and, and really make sure everybody has an opportunity to see sort of the final before it goes to the board of directors, which then will go to the board of directors in March for uh, formal approval. Any questions about that? Julie, quick question for me. Um, when will the meeting appointment go out? I believe we set a date for the meeting three. I think we were tentatively looking at the 15th of February, I believe. I think we just needed to confirm it with some internal staff, but we will. We should plan on getting that out this week, getting that on the, on the calendar. So February 15th, um, afternoon, we're looking at 3 p.m. So once we confirm that, we'll get... Um, notices out to that will be the um well that who all will be get that notice because the rebuilding services subgroup is a subset and then the service sectors where all of the technical working group was invited so well we're planning on inviting everyone who attended before but we'll also actually send it out to the entire twg as well okay. just to make sure that we don't miss anybody yeah um, and then george has a question over here julie any specific um plans to have focus section sessions for the big employment centers. I don't think we have anything on the calendar right now, but certainly as people reach out to you, um, we can get things scheduled. Yep, absolutely. Danny, looks like you have a question. Yeah, just uh, real quick, I guess, so, so two points for clarification. Um, one, so I guess with the public input, will, will there, I was working with the assumption there'd be some virtual town halls, is that, is that expected to so we're not doing we're doing this engagement tool in lieu of the town halls for this piece we are talking about doing some additional town halls in the next phase for the mobility plan for the future the the problem um danny we went back and forth on this and we looked at it a lot of different ways it's so much information and so you know pulling a, a public meeting together you can't walk through 130 pages of route changes and so what we were hoping to do was really provide a tool that allows people to get to that level and then have individual meetings with those those folks that maybe don't have the same accessibility online. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So I appreciate that um, explanation. I, I guess the other the other question, and I know it's. I mean, we're gonna we're already hearing it from customers and. Um, you know, riders is really any discussion around, um, it is a five-year outlook. There's some budget assumptions when the service can start, but even the phase, you know, the potential for phasing and, you know, there are some route restorations that, um, you know, we have many who've been looking forward to and, you know, are pointing to that this plan brings that. Um, will there be some messaging and or, general steps around, you know, how phasing will roll out? I think that is a good question. We do not have a phased plan between now and 2027 um, at this point, but uh, as Christina discussed, we will be addressing this in each of the three times a year service uh, service planning process within RTD. And so those that's where the proposals will come up and then we will have a public outreach associated with each of those phases to get people's uh, comments and thoughts. And the phasing will be tied directly to finances as well as workforce availability. But the, the phasing will go and be decided on as we're moving through the service sector process and there will be a public comment um, period associated with each of those phases and each of those decision points. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So appreciate it. Thank you, Danny. Yeah, okay. Um, we covered that. Good. Now we'll um, talk a bit about the mobility plan for the future. We have some really great and interesting information here. So just as a recap, um, you'll remember that the mobility plan for the future is the piece that takes us out and looks at you know, land use plans, growth in, the, in our region out beyond you know, 2027, we're looking all the way out to 2050. What are the travel patterns? What do they look like? Um, what are the needs of our community? And then really trying to dig into 
how is our industry and transportation changing and evolving and how can RTD um, work with some of those changes to make sure that they continue to provide the best um, mobility, that they're a great mobility provider now and um, moving into the future. Um, so we started off with some guiding principles that you all have seen at a number of meetings and we have the customer comes first and that's just really our, our stakeholder and public engagement that we're doing throughout the process, trying to solicit input all the time. Um, and we have up on the blue line up on the top sort of middle is the travel market and demand analysis. This is all the modeling that we did and um, looking at you know, what that growth would look like. And then on the bottom, we start to develop those strategies. And you'll remember that the last couple of meetings we had information, we provided information on the first and last mile strategies, on the workforce challenges. We provided some feedback on the district um, boundaries analysis that we did. If, if RTD grows in size, if RTD contracts in size, um, we've been hearing pretty consistently about the fleet electrification analysis and work that's been being done. Um, as well as the maintenance facilities that are required to support the fleet. Um, and then of course, last time we also heard about mobility as a service. So this time we have a couple of updates for you. We're gonna have a bit of information on parking um, and some of the parking strategies that are being considered. We'll also hear a bit of an update on the fleet electrification um, and the facilities and sort of some next steps for RTD from that. Um, the other thing that we're going to talk a little bit about, we've been talking about sort of like what I would call the not great or perhaps even all the way to dire financial outlook that we have right now for the agency. And we're really trying to make um, the best out of the funds that are available. Um, one of the issues that we need to talk about is Tabor. And so um, we have our teaming partner EPS with us today to talk a little bit about that. So I think um, let's go ahead and dive in. There's a lot of good information. Um, and Rachel is going to give us some background on the Tabor analysis that they completed. Thanks, Holly. Dire situations are where I thrive. So this will be great. Um, so I'm they Rachel. keep Simmons. telling Rachel she needs to find us more money. Yeah. Rachel, go find us more money. <laughs> Got to dig out the treasure chest I buried at some point. Um, so I'm Rachel Shinman. I'm with Economic and Planning Systems. Um, and Dan Gimond is on the call as well. And we're one of the financial consultants on the team. And so as Holly mentioned, um, I'm gonna walk through an analysis that we did um, to understand what the impacts of Tabor are um, as they relate to RTD's finances. So a little bit of a refresher for those of you who don't live and breathe Tabor. Um, so the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights uh, was uh, an amendment passed to the Colorado Constitution in 1992. Um, and the key piece that we're looking at here is how it limits the revenue um, that governments or other agencies can retain and spend. So governments ge generate revenue, um, whether through sales taxes, property taxes, what have you, and Tabor puts limits on how much of that revenue can potentially be retained. Um, now, one thing to note is that communities can eliminate this requirement through uh, an election. And as you'll see, it's a pretty popular uh, track to take for most places in the, in the state because we'll see just how much of an impact it potentially has. Um, and so anytime you hear about a place debrucing, um, this is what they're referring to is um, getting rid of these, these revenue limits. So you can go to the next slide um, and how it affects RTD specifically, um, so obviously it sets limits on the amount of revenue that can be generated by RTD in each fiscal year. Um, and there are, there are two key components to RTD's revenue generation right now. Um, there's the 0.6% sales and use tax for the base system and then 0.4% for fast tracks. And you'll see in this analysis, we're focusing on the 0.6%, um, which is currently exempt from Tabor, um, but will lose that exemption in 2024 uh, when the T-Rex bonds are repaid. And so that's the impetus of this analysis. So on the next slide, we have the key questions that we're looking at, which are premised on this expiration of the exemption. So understanding how the Tabor limits would affect RTD revenue, and then how these findings would inform considerations of debrucing. 
similar like we saw to most jurisdictions in the state. And so there are two components to this analysis. There's the agency revenue, which is how much sales and use tax is collected. And then there's how Tabor calculates growth limits or growth allowances. And so that's looking at inflation and annual local growth. So inflation is um, the increase in the consumer price index. So that's pretty set. And then local growth is the change in actual value of taxable, taxable property in whatever jurisdiction. Right. So for Colorado, it would be the increase in actual value of taxable property across the whole state. Um, and then any jurisdiction would be looking um, at its own boundaries. And so the, the crux of the limit is in this blue box. If revenue from the source is not excluded from the spending limits um, exceed the local growth, then you have to refund that excess. And so that's the basis that we're looking at is what would that refunding look like? So uh, on the next slide, we have it broken down in high level examples before we get into the, all the fun, real hundreds of millions numbers. Um, so you can see these two pieces. So there's the local growth on the left. So we have inflation and the change in value. And so for this example, let's say we have 1% inflation growth and 3% growth in property value. So our local growth, our comparison point is 4%, right? It's the 1% plus the three. That's the maximum allowable percentage growth under Tabor. So then we compare that to the revenue that's collected. So we have two examples. Let's say in example one, RTD sees a 5% increase in sales and use tax revenue. Because that 5% is higher than the 4% on the left side, we would have to refund the difference in the revenue. If sales and use tax revenue only increased 3%, we're fine. Nothing has to happen because it was below the allowable taper limit. So on the next slide, this just outlines how we structured this analysis. So we have these three data inputs. So inflation comes from Bureau of Labor Statistics um, that's set out in the Tabor language. It's the Denver Aurora Lakewood CPI. Local growth. Um, so we're looking at, generally speaking, all of the districts, counties. We've excluded Wells just because it's such a small portion that including the total property valuation for the county um, wasn't uh, really critical to the analysis. Um, and just for data av availability, we're using assessed value as opposed to actual value, which has a little bit of an impact, um, but we're just recognizing it as a component of the analysis. And then the district revenue um, is the actual sales and use tax collections um, that RTD has received. And so the key question that we're looking at again is how would Tabor limits have affected RTD revenue? And so we're doing a backwards looking analysis because we can get all of the actual data um, and we're looking from 2007 through to 2019. So we're looking over multiple economic cycles because as we'll see, that's a, a pretty key component of how the data plays out. And so looking at over this time period, if RTD had been subject to Tabor, what would revenue generation have looked like? So on the next slide, we have our first step is to identify which years RTD would have had to refund revenue. So you can see in this table um, with all of these lovely numbers. So at the top, we have this local growth. Um, so that's the property valuation for the district counties. And we can see the year over year change and then the CPI and the year over year change for that. And so at the bottom, we have those two added together and that is the total allowable revenue growth. And so then we look at the actual growth in sales and use tax revenue and we compare them. And if it's green, we're good to go. If it's red, the increase in sales and use tax was higher than the local growth and we have a refund year. So on the next slide, we play this out from 2007 through to 2019. And we can see there are four years uh, where the district would have had to refund revenue. So that's the first step of this analysis. Then the next step is to calculate the refunds and the adjusted growth. So there's two pieces to this. One is how much revenue would have had to be refunded and then the second part is what does that do to the revenue moving forward? So for this example, 2011 is the first year that would have had a refund. 
And so in this case, uh, the increase in sales and use tax was almost 13% higher than the change in local growth because it was negative. Um, and so we have to adjust the revenue down. And then that then becomes the base for the next year. So what we see it, through this analysis is the cumulative impact of the refund years. Um, so we still apply the same growth rate to the revenue, um, but from the lower base. And so again, on the next slide, we see it played out over time, looking at these four years. So 2011, 2012, 2014, and 2018 would be the refund years um, to make the revenue increase the same as the local growth increase. Um, and again, we see how that resets the base. And so we end up with a fair amount less revenue. Um, and to see just how much less, uh, we look at the next slide. Um, so over time, from 2007 to 2019, the actual um, average annual growth rate of sales and use tax revenue was 3.86%. Um, accounting for Tabor refunds, uh, that would have been 1.4% annual growth. And so over this time period, it would have resulted in almost $645 million in refunded revenue, which is nearly 17% of the total collections over this time. Um, so it's not an insignificant impact. Um, and this analysis was really designed to help us understand, you know, what's the context that we're looking at and what questions need to be considered. So it's a lot of numbers and a lot of analysis in one go. So and a lot of money that you have yes. found, Rachel. Yes. <laughs> and it's going to, you know, it would potentially <clears throat> have some impact on our projection of future revenues as we as we're looking forward in the in the fiscally constrained plan in terms of if we are going to be as we currently are constrained by Tabor after 2024 that would that would sort of um, that would dictate a, a more we don't have a number yet but that would dictate a more conservative uh, um, uh, annual growth factor that we would be applying to revenues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Um, questions, Jean, I see a hand. Hi, Rachel, thanks so much for that information. Um, I think <laughs> um, this sounds kind of nuts to me, right? So, um, but it is what it is. Um, is there um, any opportunity by which we can change this 2024 time frame? I could probably answer that. I mean, the change would be if, if RTD, like all those other local governments that Rachel showed on the first slide, uh, decided to go to a Tabor election and asked to be, um, and asked the voters of the district if they would be allowed to retain ex excess revenues above uh, above what the Tabor limits were are, so it re would require basically an election of uh, or at a general election they would the the voters of the district, which is most of, of all of the counties that we looked at. Um, would have to vote yay or nay on, on basically diversity. Mm -hmm. Right. Right now, because the exemption is tied to the bond payments, so that that's an immovable object. Once the final payment's made, the exemption as it currently stands would be gone. And that's, so and that's why this doesn't apply to the 0.4% fast tracks uh, revenues, because all of the fast tracks revenues are tied up in bond issues through what is it, uh, Holly 2039, I think. It, it, and some even beyond, I think, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I did wanna ask, so, I mean, 2024 is right around the corner. We're talking about an election. So if that's a recommendation coming out of this, which it seems like, I mean, I, I think, I think it sounds like it needs to be, right? This needs to be something we need to explore for RTD to be sustainable and to meet some of their, their goals. I mean, it's sort of been nice to have to capture that money for just outstanding um, investments that RTD is already trying to um, make. So 
it seems like that's a, a pretty near term recommendation. If you're well, trying to do that by that's true. It, but I think uh, it's a two part question. I mean, from a revenue perspective, it does seem like there's a pretty strong case for debrucing. Um, there's also a political question of, you know, when's the appropriate time frame or year to go to the voters. It doesn't necessarily right. have to be 2024. It could be 2026, for instance. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's not as though you miss your opportunity to do it. If you don't hit it in 2024, you can do it after that. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Um, I see a hand up, Alex. Yeah, I had a question on the Tabor refunds. <clears throat> so if we don't have a successful election sometime and the um, our Tabor exemption expires in 2024, how does the sales tax refund work? Like in a property taxing district, you refund people's property tax bills, but you know, I'd spend my sales tax that I contribute to RTD is spent at 500 locations a year. How how does RTD know who to send the money to to refund? I honestly, I, if if there's a lawyer in the room that wants to answer the question, you could go ahead. My understanding, or my and I may be wrong, is that it's going to be done on a per capita basis uh, for the number of, of of individuals in in the population within the district. We can try and find out more too. I. I... Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question because I yeah. honestly don't know the answer with certainty. Any other questions for Rachel or Dan? Sorry to be see. the bearer of bad news here. But. I was going to say, one day we'll have good news. <laughs> I feel that it is honestly is a tremendous opportunity. I'm going about it as opportunity. I, I like that. Last half full, right? Yeah, yes, that's right. That's what we need. Um, okay, so the next, I think Christina is out there and she's going to step us through there with, uh, she's with Walker Parking. They've been diligently working in the background on um, making recommendations around how, you know, RTD has a lot of assets out in the community with the parking. And um, they've made some recommendations about what might make the most sense moving forward um, to meet um, the needs of, of uh, the riders. Christina? Thank you. So we've divided our recommendations up into several categories. The first being uh, looking at management of the parking supply itself. Um, with this, the recommendations uh, that we're putting forth is we need to manage the supply and first providing infrastructure for electric vehicles. EVs are here. Um, there's a lot of commuters along the I-25 corridor, um, the I-70 corridor, who are coming into the Denver metro area via EV, and they're looking for places to charge those vehicles. Um, as it stands now, there are two spaces throughout the entirety of the RTD system. So we really need to expand on this, not only for those customers, but also to support the future electrification of the RTD fleet. We also looked at right sizing the RTD parking supply, and this would fall under a couple of subcategories, uh, one being conversion of parking supply to support more of a mobility hub, as we've previously discussed, then looking at the partial or full sale of parking facilities within the RTD system. Um, and these, of course, would vary depending on, as we've noted here in the lower corner, uh, a framework for that decision making, considering what is the capacity of the parking supply and the land area that is available. If that parking supply is converted, is there sufficient land there to support other modes of transportation or to make that attractive to a developer? We also wanna consider the future and existing parking utilization. Um, are there going to be route ex expansions that is going to increase the need for more parking at that site? Um, and what those impacts will be, not only to the parking, but to the connections to that park and ride facility. We wanna look at the land use context within the area. Is there development occurring that will bring more demand, more background growth, if you will, to that parking supply? And then looking at 
both what the existing and future first and last mile connections are and the infrastructure to support those. So as we're providing more alternative connections, we can reduce the parking supply and look at monetizing that to support RTD uh, and the transit services that are provided to customers. Along these lines, we're looking at reducing future parking oversupply. Sorry, I'm still on that last bullet. Thanks. Um, so with this, the current parking system as of 2019 has an average overall occupancy of, I wanna say it's 63%. Yes, um, which is up from 2015, uh, but only slightly. So what we've seen is today, and this has been a trend for several years now, we're oversupplying parking at many stations. Not all stations though, because I'm sure we've all been to I-25 and Broadway and had to park in the gravel lot off to the side. Um, versus if you go to 470 and University, there's maybe two cars in that parking lot. So it's really localized on where the availability and where the uh, high parking demands are occurring. But what we're seeing is the high parking demands are very much related to the type of facility, uh, the services that are coming out of there. So as we're looking at expanding the RTD system and developing future park and rides, we want to look at the parking supply and reevaluate what that metric is in terms of the parking spaces uh, as a ratio of the boardings that are projected for that site and reducing that ratio. Uh, the next category of, thank you, uh, recommendations was around the customer experience and how we're funding the operations and maintenance of the park and ride, specifically the parking system. With this, uh, we are suggesting the integration of the parking payment platform, uh, which uh, sneak peek or spoiler alert, if you will, we are recommending parking fees, uh, but we, we do recommend integrating that parking fee platform with the transit fee platform for convenience. This technology is out there and is being used in communities across the US, specifically in the Washington DC area. Uh, LA Metro has implemented this. Uh, so this is something that we've been watching and it's a growing trend within the industry for sure. Um, as I mentioned, we are recommending uh, parking user fees. This really isn't necessarily so much as a revenue graph, but of course, you know, the revenues will be used to support the parking system. It's more to, manage parking demands and to efficiently distribute those demands throughout the system. As you can see here, we are recommending a demand-based user fee. A second, um, if you will, uh, impact of parking fees is to reduce the subsidy that is being paid by those who are riding transit and not using parking today with the parking fee being absorbed into that transit fee. So we would then be able to offer subsidies to those who need them, much in line with the subsidies and the discounts that are offered today for qualified individuals, your members of the military, um, those who meet income qualifications, uh, aides and service workers and the like. We also recommend expanding the permit. I'm sorry, if you can go back one, thanks. We do recommend expanding the permit program uh, there are, of course, lease opportunities at many of the park and rides today. We do recommend um, expanding this to include not only those standard spaces, but also some premium and reserve location. Um, as I mentioned at I-25 and Broadway, that's a very high utilized station. We could provide some covered spaces that are offered at a premium price for those who can and are willing to pay for those. Um, we can also provide carpool and van pool uh, spaces, whether at a price or to reduce the vehicles at those facilities. Uh, but these would be signed specific for those branded vehicles to make enforcement a little bit easier. Thanks. <clears throat> and then looking at how we can leverage some of our operational efficiencies and partnerships within the industry. Uh, specifically expanding the monetization of assets. And by this, we're talking about sponsorship and advertising opportunities at the park and rides. 
A great example of this is several park and rides offer vendors the opportunity to name a facility or advertise at a facility, if you will, and they can provide exclusive services to those who are parking there. For instance, um, there's one park and ride system that they have a sponsorship with a local dealership and they're the dealership can advertise on site. They also have a key drop box. So if I park my vehicle there, the dealership can grab my key out of the drop box while I'm taking transit the rest of my commute to work, do my oil change and return my vehicle uh, at the end of the day. So um, we're also looking at enhanced enforcement because of course, if you're going to charge user fees, you have to enforce those. Uh, if you don't enforce them, people won't pay them. It's a snowball effect, of course. This can be done with the existing technology that's there. Um, SP Plus is the current provider of those services. They do use LPR technology, which is, which is license plate recognition. That is currently used to scan uh, plates to identify those who are uh, oper or owned by residents within the RTD district versus those who are not. That same technology can also look at has that license plate been paid for? How long was that payment? Have it, has it expired? And should that vehicle then be cited? It's a really easy integration uh, that can happen with that existing technology. So we also, with that, recommend reviewing and auditing those third-party agreements. As I mentioned, there is a third-party agreement in place currently. So we wanna look at what are the services that that agreement is providing? If enforcement is one of those, uh, you know, does it designate how often that enforcement occurs, uh, what the uh, hit rate is? For instance, an industry best practice is to have a 75% capture rate. Of course, if you hit 100% of violators, you're just gonna get a lot of complaints about having a very aggressive parking enforcement system. That's why that 75% is a really nice sweet spot. And that's where that audit comes in, where you want a third party to come in and confirm that the violations are being captured at the rate that's designated within the agreement. If the frequency of enforcement isn't happening, if, those, if that hit rate isn't happening, are there um, incentives or disincentives for that operator outlined in that contract to ensure that they are meeting that level of service that you have agreed to? And then in some areas where it may not make sense to work with a third party operator, that's where you might look to partner with a local agency either to provide collection of fees and or those enforcement services. So this just summarizes uh, what our uh, recommendations are for the parking program. Of course, these are all structured around those guiding principles for the Reimagine RTD. And we really wanna highlight the need to implement paid parking. This is something that we looked at in 2016. The rates that we're recommending haven't changed. Uh, one thing to highlight with those proposed rates is that they are below market rates. But as we've discussed, any rate that is uh, implemented for parking is going to be seen as a transit rate increase. So we're really trying to balance that removing the subsidy for those who aren't using the, uh, the parking but also disincentivizing those who are getting free parking at RTD stations, but not using RTD transit services. We're also looking uh, at expanding the reserve parking that's available to make it convenient for those who use RTD on a regular basis. And then of course, monetizing those parking assets, whether that's converting the parking asset, uh, advertising in the parking assets, um, and expanding those, those partnerships and sponsorship opportunities. Fantastic. Thank you, Christina. That was a lot of information. I see that there, um, David had a question over in the chat asking about would the parking fees be um, as it is existing only if you're over 24 hours or are you thinking about expansion mm -hmm. and applying those to day users? Um, if we can go back to that slide, this would be expanding to day users, um, but we are maintaining the in-district and out-of-district. Um, if you can go back one more, I think, there we go. So we have in-district and out-of-district. This would be a per entry or per day. So if you, for instance, 
came back and left for lunch, the fee would be applied again. Uh, but this is a per entry fee that would be applied for day users. Okay. All right, thank you. We have a couple of hands. Um, Ron? Everybody, Ron Papsdorf for Dr. Cog. Um, I, first of all, I just want to acknowledge what a tricky issue parking is for, for transit systems um, and, and really understand that. I think there's a, there's a balance that has to be struck um, because at some point, I mean, have, without good bus access to the light rail system, um, a lot of people park and ride. And by um, if, if you don't strike the right balance with how you charge for parking, you potentially um, discourage people from using transit for commute trips. Because at some point, it's, it's already a disincentive, right, to have to drive and park, transfer to, to a bus or a, or, a, or a train, and then get to your destination. So there's already a built-in disincentive to doing that. And if you if you kind of raise the parking rates to a level where it, at some point as a, as a commuter, um, your thought process is it's not worth, it's not worth the, the additional cost. I might as well just drive all the way um, and park at my, at park my destination, even knowing that it's gonna, the parking fee itself is going to be higher. But if I don't buy a monthly transit pass, then you know, that probably kind of balances, balances out uh, with the increased um, parking charge. So I think we have to be really, really careful about how we do this. And uh, maybe if you're a monthly pass holder, then you have access to park and ride um, during certain hours for, for commute. Um, I, I just would encourage, there, there's a lot of nuance here, and I would encourage you to be very, very careful about how you do this, um, because the last thing we wanna do is encourage more people to drive and avoid transit um, if we're not careful about how we institute um, paid parking. And, and believe me, I, I'm a believer in paid parking. It's a it's a limited it's a limited resource, and um, there's demand for it. And I think we see that with I-25 and Broadway. And um, you know, I think a lot of people from the outskirts of the transit district drive as close as they can to downtown, and then park at I-25 and Broadway because it's about the closest park and ride you have to downtown. And then they do a short bus or train trip into their final destination. And that's not good for our system either. So I, I get this. I'm just encouraging um, some, some thoughtful approach to this rather than just a blanket, hey, we need to charge for park. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ron. Kim? Thanks, Kim Mormon, City of Thornton. I would also echo Ron's comments. I would also be careful uh, in a statement you made, Christina. We uh, have much of our area that is not serviced directly by RTD buses or flex ride. And so they drive to a park and ride, park for free and then drive down, but they're subsidizing through their sales tax. And so to say that they're not, that, that the uh, rider that doesn't use parking, the subsidizing the parking is probably not a good statement to make because you'll probably raise some some uh, some ire of, of our elected officials. Um, so I would suggest you consider how you approach that and, and how you say it. I'm not disagreeing mm -hmm. that parking might be a good thing to pay for, but on the other hand, um, as Ron says, if they may have to pay for that parking, and there's not a reduced transit fare, fare um, so it evens out, uh, why not just drive downtown and, and park? And, and therefore, we don't accomplish some of the other goals that, that our state legislature has set of reducing vehicle miles traveled and, and getting people on transit, reducing greenhouse gases, et cetera. So I think it's a very delicate um, balance as you move forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, Thank you are, for those insights. Yeah, those are good comments. Daniel? Hi, yeah, this is Daniel Hutton with Denver South. Um, I, I agree with uh, Kit and Ron. Looks like uh, Kate Williams chimed in too, where, you know, the, the transit advocate in me is in favor of this, but realistically and coming out of COVID and all of the endless nudges that people have um, against taking transit and tacking on another one, just want to be really careful about this issue, especially because, you know, Denver South, we are 
we do represent kind of suburban stakeholders. So um, I, I would just uh, urge caution here and, and happy to, to continue discussions about it, but um, it, I, I just can't decide if it's the right time for this or not. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sarah? Thank you. Um, I completely agree with everything Ron and Kent and Daniel have said. I, I echo their sentiments and that this is very tricky, but um, also this would, could potentially discourage transit ridership um, at this time. I'm not sure if you've defined the high utilization um, uh, rate and where people would fall in that, but I just wanted to know that there are, are um, many park and rides in the North District, including um, two in Broomfield and also the Wagon Road Park and Ride that I believe may fall in that category over 80, 90%. Oh. Um, at least that was before COVID. And um, we do have very limited access to the regional transportation network. So people do drive um, and we are making efforts for better TOD and those sorts of things. But the reality is most people drive to these stations to access regional transportation. And so I really hate to see those um, users be further discouraged to uh, be charging an additional $4 on a regional charge. So about $15 for your commute. Might as well just hop on the freeway and keep on going wherever you're going. Um, so I just wanna note that. And um, I do know that RTD has limited resources to expand those uh, park and rides at this time. Um, one of those park and rides is the US 36 Broomfield and um, we are promised another one through the fast tracks. Um, but that obviously is not going to be coming in any short order here. Um, and I definitely know that Wagon Road Park and Ride has been oversubscribed for quite some time. And finally, the Flatiron um, Station also provides access to the airport. And um, I think it provides a great service to be able for people to be able to go to the airport and use the AB service. Um, and so if you're charged four or even six dollars a day because it is oversubscribed, um, while you're away and traveling, um, that could further discourage people using the service to get to the airport. Thank you. Those are good. Uh, let me see. Oh, you've got a flurry of hands here. I'm gonna have to cut you off at about 4.15 because we have a couple more slides, but let's try and get through these. Hugh Lang? Yeah, uh, really quick, just want to, uh echo uh, what others said, but I just want to say, you know, if the goal of this uh, charging parking is for parking management, then it doesn't make sense to have a base charging for those uh, parking facilities with, uh, I mean, lower demand. Uh, so maybe you set a threshold if it's truly for parking management, maybe if it's over 70, 85 percent as a, you know, uh, that's when you begin to think about some implementations of charging to truly manage parking versus revenue connections. And, and also I was wondering if we're charging parking, maybe there should also be ways to you know, additional uh, accessibility, uh, local bus or flex ride to provide additional connections from the businesses or from the residents to the parking ride. So you provide additional options for people, not just drive and park, park and ride versus, you know, they, they take a bus and get there or take other uh, ways of getting there. Just mm -hmm. thumbs up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first, the existing and future first and last mile connections is one of the considerations that we have built into uh, the suggested framework. I also wanted to just quickly address when we discuss management of the parking facility and the costs that go into that, it is not just the enforcement and collection of fees. We're also referring to the snow removal, the maintenance of the, the asphalt or the concrete itself, the line striping, all of those have costs on an annual basis that RTD is currently covering with transit fares, and our proposal is for user fees to help offset some of those costs to those who are most directly benefiting from those. So just one quick clarification on that. Bill? Well, I just want to acknowledge, I mean, the comments, and I, I think you can um, get a sense. Previous conversations that we've had, we know this is a very sticky issue. Um, our board has has um, typically not wanted to really engage in this conversation. We, we included it in the scope for reimagine again, for the purpose of looking at 
strategically what's our best path for or what's our kind of our things that we should consider as a, as a path forward. I, I think you can all be one of the things I also wanted to mention is I, and I want to thank, you know, kind of Ron and, and the accountability committee for this. I mean, one of the benefits that we do have now that we didn't have at the start of reimagine is that some of the parking restrictions because of the recent legislation are now no longer in place. So I think we do have some flexibility about how we might do this, but your points are all well taken. Anytime we would do anything related to charging for parking, it is going to be, you know, we're going to think very strategically about it. The, the idea of dynamic, I think parking and charging for parking in a dynamic way is, is, is somewhat appealing because it allows us to focus on areas where we think that, you know, it's not going to impact ridership. And so I do think that we, we do hear you what you're saying, because it, this is, again, going into this, we knew this was going to be a very a challenging issue to, to address. And that, you know, understanding that, you know, implementing this over time is going to be it's still going to, there's still amount of, a lot amount of work to do to get to a point where we'd implement uh, a paid parking program. Just wanted to kind of raise that kind of points just to everybody that's been speaking. Fantastic. Thanks, Bill. Alex, and then we're going to, um, I'm going to move us along to the next section and we can reach out to Christina post meeting. I just wanted to thank RTD and the consultant team for including the parking recommendations and prompting this discussion. As has been noted, it's complicated, um, but I think it's a really important conversation, especially as we get into the fair study and past programs work over the next year plus. Um, in the context of retaining stable revenue, giving away essentially all of the day use parking for free right now makes it a lot harder to lower fares because lowering fares is seen as losing revenue to RTD, which it is. Uh, whereas if lower fares are done in conjunction with charging for parking, RTD revenue can be held stable and provide folks who don't need to drive to stations with lower transit fares overall, which I think is a benefit. Um, so I think it's, it, it's obviously a complicated issue, but I hope it's done in conjunction as much as possible with the fare study and the past program work that's just beginning. Um, mm. But I'm excited to see it happen and uh, really encourage the RTD team to consider uh, monetizing parking uh, for a number of reasons. And then on the last um, topic of where there's excess parking supply, you know, the where RTD has parking lots that are filled with cars, that's at least providing some benefit to RTD in the sense of bringing riders into the system. Where RTD is providing 100 spaces and there's only 50 cars there. Those other 50 empty spaces are not providing any benefit and are costing RTD a lot of money to maintain and plow and all that good stuff. And so I think looking at where is there excess parking in the system, where is there going to be excess parking in the system well into the future, and could that land be better used by something else or sold off to developers to bring riders um, who would either live or work directly adjacent to RTD stations, I think that's a really important point, not to mention that you know, owning land that's not generating any revenue, whereas selling it off to developers would bring revenue to the system uh, is another important consideration to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, those are great, super points. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, and then Christina, for your information, there is um, some, there's a chat um, from Mike that I'd like you to just take a look at to have in your hopper of things as you move forward, okay? Absolutely. Um, all right, thanks, Christina, and um, thanks to the EPS team as well. Um, so Katie is going to provide us a bit of an update on, you know, for this last several meetings, we've had some updates on the methodology and process for evaluating um, zero emission vehicles and the um, facilities plans that need to be um, modified to, to support that. Um, and we have some early recommendations for RTD to, for consideration. Um, Katie, do you want to give us a few updates? Sure. Thanks, Holly. Um, so I think a little bit giving the strategic framework like Bill had just mentioned for parking, I think as we're looking at zero emission vehicle planning, it really is kind of the what could the future look like should RTD decide to go down this path of electrification, um, knowing that there's other technologies coming online and, and what it could potentially mean for such a large agency. Um, so kind of recapping, like Holly said, and I'll get into some of these recommendations, but um, we've had folks from the WSP team, and I think Cliff and Carrie are both on the call today, um, providing some information along the way to get you guys up to speed. I will tell you, I am not going to go into any detail 
detail today, so I will spare you, at least in this section. Um, but we have been moving forward with all of the deliverables and based on the initial finding or the initial electrification model kind of methodology that was developed, um, WSP went forward and did a whole kind of electrification planning, as you recall last time, understanding what blocks of service would meet and how many, you know, how many they could meet within the within the system. And from that, we've gone and kind of looked at then what does the facility side look like? So what would it actually require to do battery electric bus implementation at these different facilities in terms of infrastructure? And I and Carrie kind of highlighted that a little bit as well last time. So we have that draft report, um, the battery electric bus implementation um, needs facility analysis is in RTD's hands for review right now. Um, the other piece in terms of it kind of combines both the facilities and the electrification component was looking at, should, you know, based on RTD's needs and future growth and kind of looking out towards 2050, um, what would it look like if RTD needed to build a new facility for bus? They needed to build a 250 bus facility or a 500 bus facility and how many of them would they need and what would that look like? So that's another element, kind of the greenfield space program, if you will, um, to understand what some of those future opportunities would be to, to maintain the service growth and, and you know, growth of the system over time. Um, the other document that we have delivered to RTD for review is the rail facilities conditions um, and capacity report. So really doing an inventory. I think you guys will recall that um, a few months, well, not a few months ago, last summer, the WSP team was here, went to all the rail facilities, all the bus facilities to do an inventory and get an on the ground look. Um, so this is an outcome of that, of really getting into the nuts and bolts of the rail facilities and understanding what the capacity is for growth or expansion and really the not opportunity for growth and expansion. Um, and then the last document and kind of for the next step for this process is the fleet and facility phasing report. So how do we ultimately bring all of these pieces together? How do we look at the overall maintenance of RTD facilities, bus and rail? How do we look at the potential for fleet electrification? And what does that mean in terms of, you know, what the needs are for existing and future facilities and kind of putting together an approach in, in a like I said, kind of a should RTD decide to go down the path of electrification, what would that look like? What would the requirements and needs be? Um, so that's kind of a snapshot of kind of all the things that are out on the table right now and under review. Um, and as we're kind of moving into crafting the actual you know, mobility plan for the future, looking at some of the preliminary recommendations for RTD, um, is really looking at the looking at the viability of alternative fuels. So, you know, there's been a lot of discussion, I think, with transit agencies, local agencies, RTD, um, is electrification, you know, is that what we should be moving towards? Should we be looking at alternative fuels? Should we be looking at the fuel cell, um, the hydrogen side? So really kind of diving in, you know, this scope mm -hmm. of on electrification, but looking at how other alternate alternative fuels could, could kind of provide that path forward for RTD as well. Um, and that's kind of the second bullet is what, what is the interest in, and what is the actual movement forward should RTD decide to go down this path of electrification. Um, of course, looking incrementally at the transition of the fleet, um, should they decide to, to do that, there's a lot of, with the new infrastructure bill, a lot of additional electric vehicle funding coming out or zero emission vehicle funding. So what are the opportunities there? And is there something that RTD could be leveraging in the near or midterm um, to kind of start a transition? So um, a lot in the hopper and a lot of things moving forward. And like I said, we're, we're not digging into the real details of any of these reports today, but the question that we had for this group, and I actually was gonna ask Julie if you could pop this in the chat so we could have people kind of respond in the chat is, you know, how much interest is there in kind of digging into the details about the zero emission bus work that's being done for this process? Um, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of information. The, like I said, the RTD team across all disciplines is reviewing information right now. Um, but we absolutely wanna, you know, include you in the conversation if you are interested and we could pull together a subgroup to present things in more detail. So um, I think if we can kind of just get a little inventory, if you're a, a yes, throw a yes in the chat of that you would be interested in a subgroup, um, or if you have any comments or questions about what that might look like, um, we can talk about that as well. So 
It looks like Alex, I think, is this a new hand? Sorry, no. <laughs> I was too busy talking. I was like, I didn't see if it went up or if it had been up. So, um, so I guess any thoughts, questions kind of on, on process status, where we are, kind of how this is going to roll into the larger mobility plan for the future and um, kind of interest in the potential for a subgroup. It looks like David Kretzinger is a yes. Kate is in an alternative fuels group. That's all I've seen so far, specific to that okay. question. Uh, Danny O'Connor just jumped in, yeah. Okay. Okay, well, why don't we um, feel free to continue to chime into the chat, everybody, and um, we'll kind of do a little assessment after this and see what the appropriate next step would be um, and can circle back with this group. And of course, we'll be giving updates at you know the February and March meetings as well. So um, I think that's all we have for today on that topic if there's no more questions. Fantastic, thanks, Katie. All right, Julie, I think you're, um, you're, you're always bringing us home, Julie. The whole stretch here. Thank yeah. you guys so much. It's been a great discussion this meeting. Really appreciate it. So just really quick, we've talked about most of this, um, the February 9th. After this meeting, I will send out a little toolkit like we talked about with social media posts and graphics and the you know the web link and a little uh, newsletter text. So I'll get that out right after this meeting to everybody. So really appreciate any of your help um, getting the word out and feel free to contact me directly if you'd like to help. I'd like some help organizing an individual meeting and responding to specific questions. So really appreciate that. So um, as we talked about, you know, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, meetings as requested, we're going to do some customer panels focus groups in early February, take a look out, we're tentatively looking at three o'clock on February 15th for the final rebuilding service working group, we'll be sending that out. And again, uh, all culminating in, in uh, March timeframe for the RTD board of directors consideration. And then we're going to be switching really quickly to the mobility plan for the future. So we're getting close on that. You've been seeing bits and pieces of it. We're going to, that's really going to be our shift to the, that's going to be a shift of our focus here over the next couple of meetings. And we will be doing um, more, we will be doing public outreach in the March timeframe. We didn't want to do it on top of the SOP to kind of confuse the general public. There's a lot going on with RTD, but in March, you're going to see some public meeting opportunities, you know, and again, we are talking about another online interactive way of learning a little bit and providing some feedback on mobility plan for the future um, and you know some additional outreach that we'll be doing in that March time frame. So with that, we'll open it up. I think we got five more minutes if we have any more questions or I think we added one more quick slide if oh, we did. Uh, but I think that you covered that already in the it's just the, the time frame for the oh perfect. So okay yes SOP now and mobility plan for the future February yep. focus for February and March. So March. absolutely. All right, that was a lot and a lot of super input for us to take away. And um, I got some great stuff. I don't know if we, I don't think we said this out loud, but um, Danny suggested making sure that we have Spanish translation. So I'll do some checking on that and how the tool works for that. Um, and certainly we can have some, some Spanish access available. So we'll, I'll check on that. Anything else? Well, if you, as I always say, if you're falling asleep tonight and you have some ideas, send them our way. Morning, noon, and night, preferably email, not call, but you know, we'll take it however we can get it. Um, I very much appreciate your time, everybody. And um, we'll uh, be talking to the advisory committee like always tomorrow. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you next month. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye.